this. Hello and welcome everybody uh, to uh, today's uh, program panel uh, from the American Distance Education Consortium. My name is Oliver Brandman and I welcome everybody today uh, to our interesting webinar with Dr. Barbara Chamberlain uh, entitled It's Okay to Play, How Game-Based Learning Teaches the Hard Stuff. Uh, Barbara and I met first, I think it was back at the Orlando at last year's ADEC meeting and then again as part of a small troop of uh, um, a very brave people uh, to go to, um, to Beijing in, uh, in August last year it was um, to join up with Cabots there and attend the Cabots meeting and this year it's actually reversed uh, the ADEX symposium next week will host a few Cabots members so uh, I'm excited uh, about the uh, once again encountering many of you at that meeting Barbara unfortunately cannot make it but uh, I'm glad that she could uh, squeeze us in today uh, for this uh, interesting uh, webinar and Barbara take us away all right um, hi Hope and JC and Dave and of course anybody who's watching the um, archive version of this podcast, but since we are a small group today, um, Hope and JC, maybe you'd use the chat window and just tell me a little bit about what you do um, so that we can kind of make this more uh, personalized as we go through the presentation. Um, I'm Barbara Chamberlain. Uh, so I'm an extension appointment at New Mexico State University in our media productions department. We also call it the Learning Games Lab. Um, as I mentioned in chat, I don't normally teach, though I will this fall. It's really a position for research and development. And when Oliver and I were talking about this, the first, um, our first draft of the title was It's Okay to Play, How Game-Based Learning Teaches the Hard Stuff. And I talk a lot about the development of media and how we create things and that sort of thing. But one of the fine things I find I talk a lot about nationally is just helping people understand why game-based learning is okay. But I think for our audience and for specifically to ADEC, I probably should have titled it something more like not how game-based learning teaches the hard stuff, but how game-based learning facilitates learning the stuff it's hard to convey through lecture or reading, which is a little crazy as a title. And so then I thought, well, we could have, you know, how game-based learning complements learning beyond simply providing practice. Um, most people, at least my age or older, look at games as being great if they fit in the educational realm at all as a way to practice. That's sort of our, as a quiz, it's kind of the quiz mentality. And games just can do so much more. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that today. And if you're on Twitter, most of my tweets, I keep Twitter to be mostly about game-based learning. So if that interests you, you can follow me at eChamber. Uh, so I mentioned the Learning Games Lab. Uh, we develop materials for, oh gosh, we're working on a preschool, set of preschool apps now, up through college, through adult. We do math. We do food safety. We do um, uh, microscopes, soil labs, uh, writing ATVs, financial literacy. <laughs> we basically do games or interactive materials for, for whatever audience. And a friend of mine runs a game development studio, very successfully, it's a great studio, and he said, Barb, the problem with you guys is you're making the wrong games. You make beautiful games, you make great games, but you're making the wrong games. And I said, ouch, um, why? <laughs> So, well, so many of your games are about the stuff that you're never going to make money on. They just are not going to sell in the market. And I said, that's not our goal. Our goal isn't to sell games, which he, as a businessman, was like mind blown. Why is your goal not to sell games? And I said, our goal is to make games that help people learn the content that they're not learning any other way. And maybe they don't want to learn it or they don't know that they don't know it. That's why we make interactive tools, is to help people learn the stuff they can't learn elsewhere or to help them be exposed to content that they may not search for in other situations. So, um, JC, I see your post up there. Thank you so much. Um, I hope spring is finally coming to Michigan. So that tells you a little bit about the Learning Games Lab. We seem to have, there we go. Um, so you're probably wondering what I look like, and that's me. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I put this up for two reasons. One, I kind of like to think that's what I look like, but really that was my headshot from a stand-up comic um, about 25 years ago. So I like to put that up for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is to um, 
take pictures of yourself when you're in your 20s. That's a good thing to do. Because really now that we're 25 years later, that's really actually more what I look like. And there's actually a lot of truth to that picture because I usually have my laptop with me wherever I go. But that's who I am. Um, so let's just talk about why games and what excites me. And uh, this excites me. You've probably at least heard of Angry Birds. Angry Birds is interesting in that it's really a, it's a tight little game. It's a lot of fun. But what's interesting is if I had asked people, uh, <laughs> yeah, if I'd asked someone, well, and I, I was asking people 10 years ago, 15 years ago, do you play games? Who here plays games? People are, especially adults, are kind of hesitant to raise their hands. I don't play games. I'm a grown-up. I do serious, important things. And now, thanks in large part to Angry Birds and their billion downloads and the availability, availability on multiple mobile devices and the ability in web browsers and the availability on tablets and in consoles, a lot of people play games now. And they don't do it with their head hung in shame, but they admit they actually play games. And the leap of the casual gaming industry excites me because finally we have all these people who are starting to understand the power of games. And the power of games is in accessibility. It's in being able to play games in those short, short bursts of time wherever you're at and really use that time wisely. It's about the love of being able to see your progress and playing level five and trying level 20 and realizing you have no idea how to use that boomerang bird. But then you go back to level five or play six and seven and go through. And by the time you get to level 20, you can, you can totally use the boomerang bird and you're good at it. So seeing that progress, seeing your growth, being in a, in a social world with other people where you sit down next to someone on a plane and they played Angry Birds and you could say, oh, show me how to use that boomerang bird. And you suddenly had helped it just in time in the place you needed it. And there's, there's so many lovely things about games that are so much more than they are fun to play. So we're going to talk about that a little bit and articulate what really makes gameplay so powerful. So this is something else that excites me. My son was in preschool. He was four and I picked him up and he said, I drew you a picture. I said, okay, tell me about it, which is what you say to children when they give you a picture because you might think you know what it is and often you don't. So you say, tell me about it. And he said, well, the middle part's a flower and then on the right is a computer and on the left is a snowman. And there's arrows on both sides. So you pick the picture you want and then you use the blue button at the top to select it, which I'm a game designer, right? So the fact that my son had made an interface at four made me so proud. <laughs> Son. But more interestingly was that at four, before he had really been introduced to formal classrooms and learning environments, he understood the power of interactivity. At four, he knew that he should have some agency in what he does. He knew that I should not just look at the picture of a flower because that's what he wanted to draw, but that I should get to pick. And he knew that as the author of this picture, he needed to be prepared for what different people's preferences were. And I think nothing speaks more to the future education than how this four-year-old looked at the world. I hope it's in my DNA, Oliver. One of the nicest compliments I can have is that my children reflect what's good about me. I hope that is the case. So I want to talk not about technology for a minute. I want to talk about the Explore Children's Museum in Albuquerque. It's a fabulous museum. I know there's wonderful children and science museums throughout the country. I'm a huge museum fan and my kids are too. So we went to a week-long camp in Explora and my kids were pretty happy. They really like Explora and they would spend all day there at the camp and I would pick them up and we would have to spend another hour afterwards in this room because they didn't get enough. So this room is right at the beginning where, you know, this is a pegboard and you can move the slots and the rails and the funnels and kind of build your own kind of path going through. Um, there's several different things like this in this room. Some of them kind of are, are labeled and look a little more instructional, you know, with the degrees on your angles, different ways you can play with it. But it's really it's very interactive and it's really all to teach the same thing, kind of problem solving, velocity, path. It's all the same kind of activity in different ways. Here's the same thing, but using wooden blocks to make your path and to get a ball go through. And of course, one of the most important parts of this really small and interactive room is this, which is the bench. 
And the reason that's so important is because that's where the adult sits. You know, we, we as our parents, we engage with them for a while and we're playing with them. And then finally we're like, oh, gosh, just go play. I'm going to sit and watch. And boy, my kids can play with it for hours. So I want us to think, and if you'd like to, feel free to answer in um, the chat window. But I want us to think, what is it that makes kids museums? And let's just take that for example, because everyone seems to be really happy with kids museums. It's, it's something people go and feel good about and, and they believe it's educational, but they're happy to do it. And families are always happy. People feel really good about museums. So what is it that makes kids museums um, and, and this I don't know about is, is it that makes them effective or valuable or engaging or worthwhile? What is it that makes them work so well? And while you're thinking awesome health, I agree. While you're thinking, keep doing that, keep doing that. Um, put in the chat window what you are, what they're doing. And I'm just going to go through some photos real quickly if you haven't been to Explore, or these are typical of others of some of the things we see at Explore while you're brainstorming on that. So keep chatting. Um, so this is a laminar flow fountain. Um, fountains from all around the circle go into the go into the uh, fountain but you can press buttons but you don't know which fountain is controlled by what button so you walk around and press the button so this is a ratio you can do weights on either side to look at a ratio scale curiosity yep touch see reaction yep so the mirrors optics oh we could spend hours at the bubble table until you know that bubble liquid just runs down your wrists and makes your sleeves all wet uh, so the water flow table you can choose what you want to do. You can try to make the water flow really fast. You can try to make the water flow uphill, or you can, um, you know, try to stop it, whatever it is. Keep up those great ideas. Looking at patterns in water there. So this is my son on a bike. It's a weighted bike, about three stories up. You know, you cannot fall off that bike. It's not really possible, but you can tell by the look in his face, he was not sure if that was true. <laughs> And we went every day for five days, you would ride that bike and each day he'd go a little further out until he finally rode it all the way out. So this, there's a microphone, so there's some buttons, some different sounds there. Um, notice here there's that little slip of paper off to the side that kind of explains what's going on there if there isn't someone to explain it to you. So here you're supposed to pull that up and get that square all the way up to the top without the peg falling into the holes. I love safe place, that's a great point. Um, so this is kind of, you have an overhead projector and then you have an audience and so you can make these kind of colorful displays and project them up there. I don't know what that is. That's, yeah, that's crazy. I don't know, but you can plug and it, yeah. Okay, so we had some really good examples there. Being a kid, visually interesting, safe place to explore. Absolutely. Um, these are some of the other things I was thinking that I'll do. One, it's, it's self-directed. You know, with that water flow table, you get to decide what you want to do with that. It's different each time for each learner. My kids, every time they go, they can engage in the same experiment or the same little booth, and it'll feel different to them as they get older. And it's a different experience for the four-year-old than it is for the 14-year-old. It's assisted. Vygotsky would call it the more capable other, either by a parent or a museum staff member or by those little cards next to what you're learning that explains what's going on. It's open-ended. There's a lot of different ways to play and experience. It's interactive. That's one of the things you mentioned. Um, it's age-appropriate for a wide variety of ages. So it's amazing that they can make one thing age-appropriate for many different learners. It gives immediate feedback. You know that thing where you're trying to pull the peg up without it falling in the hole? You know exactly when it stops and when it fails. So these are just some, in addition to the things you chatted in, of the many things that makes learning effective, valuable, engaging, worthwhile. Now, you'll notice what we did not say is what makes learning effective, valuable, engaging, and worthwhile is that it be accessible to a large group of people in the most efficient way possible, such as lecture or reading, because <laughs> this is really what our educational system has been designed to do. Our educational design system was not designed to be interactive, age appropriate, uh, differentiated for different learners. It was designed to be accessible to a large group of people in the most efficient way possible. That's what many of our learning methods have evolved to be because you had to teach a lot of people something. And so lecture and reading became really effective ways to do that, though um, in their time, of course, both of those were, were innovative and, and considered technology. But set those aside and let's go back to what we know about makes 
learning effective, valuable, engaging, and worthwhile. And these are just some examples of those. But I want you to think for a minute that that's not really just what makes learning, but it's what makes something fun. And I bring that up because a lot of people, when they hear games, they say, fantastic, now we can make learning fun. And I'll tell you something, I could care less about making learning fun for people. That's not, that's not my job. And I don't want you to consider game-based learning so that your students can have fun in the classroom. It's not about gamifying your way to fun. But I want us to recognize that inherently, the things that make learning engaging makes something fun. When you are doing things that are fun for you, whether it's a game or watching a game, you have all of these things that's appropriate, it's different each time, it's self-directed, there's activity, it's open-ended, you have feedback, all of these things make something fun. So you don't have to try to make something fun. The trick is learning is fun. Our job is to not screw that up. A friend of mine, another app and game developer, says that. And it's a really important reminder to those of us who do instructional design that if we just reveal what is fun about learning and enable learning in a personalized way, that engagement is what makes the rest of learning stick. So I get asked all this all the time. Can games help people learn? And that's not a bad question. Um, but we also might consider this question because people don't really ask that much, or this question, or uh, this question, or this question, or this question, or does doing a worksheet with 220 other students help people learn? Because all of these learning methodologies are used quite regularly, but few of them receive the scrutiny or the skepticism that game-based learning does. Okay, so let's answer the question. Can games help people learn? Well, let's first look at our biases. Because if I ask you to think of two people, Person A, who plays a video game in his or her room for two hours a day, or person B, who takes the same amount of time and writes, who is using their time more effectively? Well, that's a good question. So most people, myself a few years included, would say two hours of gameplay. That's two hours of screen time. I don't know how effective that is, but let's Think about these people for a minute and say, what if person A is a high school student in a rural area that doesn't have access to higher level math courses? So they play an online game in which they're in a virtual environment working with other people to learn trig concepts. Or what if person A is using the video game two hours every day to do exercises or tone or dance or do physical exercise because that person doesn't feel comfortable or is unable to exercise outside of their home? Or what if person A is playing any number of the amazing social games that we're seeing that help uh, learn on everything from journalistic integrity to oppression of people in, 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 in different areas of the world? Or what if person A is learning content they're not exposed to in other ways? And what if person B is the Unabomber in a shack out in the woods? My point about gaming is not that gaming is powerful. My point about gaming is that learning is powerful and we have a lot of different ways to make learning happen and video gaming is one of those. So Hope, I see that you said, you know, how well do adults adapt to gameplay and what does effective mean? And um, for some reason I cannot go back to, um, to move the chat off to the right of the screen. I can only see the left part of the question. Um, and I want us to discuss that because that issue of adults adapting to gameplay and at what age do we feel comfortable with that is a really important question as we look at who our students are. When we say what does effective mean, that's another excellent question and one that should be considered in the development of the learning environment. To me, effective usually means successful understanding of content or demonstrated application of that content in problem solving, which is really the goal, or ultimately behavior change. Um, so my degrees are in educational technology and my belief is that if the technology doesn't do it, don't do it, don't use it. If your content is really understandable in lecture, in reading, in any of these other methods that are less expensive to develop in, less time consuming to develop for, use the other methods. Save 
technology for the things that it improves upon. Okay, so let's give some examples of that. Self-direction. Gameplay allows things to be self-directed. So let me go back to that museum that I was talking about and watching my kids play with this. So this you're just trying to, I don't know, what do you want the ball to do? Do you want it to leap off the end? Do you want it to land in the box? And so you can move these sliders up and down to make the ball change behavior. And my son spent hours with this. And I thought, you know, if I were a good parent, ha, 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 do we need to create one of these walls at our house? They could spend so many hours with it. Maybe we need to give them a chance to have that interactivity. They can spend so much time with this and they enjoy it. We could replicate this on a wall in our house. They could have so much fun with it. And I realized they already have that. And they have it in the game called Minecraft. Now, Hope and JC, Dave, I think, I think you've heard of Minecraft before. Oliver, I'm not sure if you have. Minecraft is a game that all of us over a certain age look at and say, how can that be any good? Look at those horrible graphics. They're so pixely and boxy, which goes to one of the secrets game developers know that few people understand, which is the graphics don't matter. If you have engaging gameplay, graphics don't matter. Yeah, so Oliver knows. Um, knows uh, Minecraft. So Minecraft, you can either play it in game mode where you have to go get resources and build yourself a protective space from basically the zombies the, who come out, the creepers who come out at night, or you can just go into creative mode and just build, 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 build. So it's about mining, going out and finding the iron, the wood, and it's about crafting, turning those things into product. So I watched my son who um, with ADHD struggles in some of the more formal learning environments and I watched him for two hours uh, build a mine car as a roller coaster around the zoo he has created in Minecraft. And he was trying to get the cart to go over the hill, down the hill, and back up the hill. And he would play with it, make the first hill taller, the smaller hill lower, make the bottom hill higher, the top one. And he, for two hours, struggled with that until, through the process of experimentation, he was able to design the perfect hill that made that mine car move exactly like he wanted it to, which is the exact same activity that he was doing in the museum. Minecraft is a phenomenon, not just because it's a game, but because it gives kids a completely open-ended sandbox environment to create. We are raising a new generation of spatially capable children in the way they can think through these problems and design and build. And that kind of spatial cognition translates very well into other types of thinking. All of these things that I'm showing have been designed by kids and built by kids. So Minecraft, absolutely, it's self-directed. The learner sets his or her own goals in it. The activity is inquiry-based. How would I do this? How can I do this? What's another way to create this? But it also creates a community of learners. There is not a manual for Minecraft. You can't go in and get set directions. So what happens is all the kids go to YouTube and make videos showing what they've learned how to do and share it with each other, which has driven every child I have put Minecraft in front of to be more inquiry-based and to be more open to sharing what they learn. So our kids are learning something that academics usually have to go to college to get, which is when you need to figure out what to do, how to do something first, go to the community and see what people know. Second, figure out what you've got to learn for yourself. And finally, share that knowledge back with your community. That is how we're teaching people to learn. And of course, like other games, Minecraft gives immediate feedback. So gameplay changes things. And gameplay can provide screen time. I'm trying a new tack with this. Nationally, people are talking about screen time and how much screen time people should have. And is two hours good or is half an hour? And got into quite a long conversation with a, a nature educator at a, a fabulous nature uh, project that I was on with my son two weeks ago. And he said, I'm just so worried about all of the screen time that these kids are having. And so here's my deal. I'm not going to, I'm tired of talking about screen time like a bad thing. In fact, I'm tired of making the argument that screen time is, I'm going to start helping people understand that actually providing screen time is what we want our children to have. This is a good thing. Now, I know the risk. These are the things we see on Facebook all the time. The day Albert Einstein feared has finally arrived, which this isn't true. Einstein actually didn't say that because um, as, um, you know, 
Abraham Lincoln says you can't read anything on the internet. So JC, you said you haven't heard of the screen time. So uh, this games TV, that's the problem with it. Is the American Association of Pediatrics have come out and said kids should have no more than two hours of screen time. And parents everywhere have guilt. And the problem with screen time is how do you define what screen time is? It totally puts the focus on the device when the focus should be on what you're doing with the device. This is one of my favorites. All this technology is making us antisocial. But of course, we would sit next to a stranger and not engage with them on a plane long before we had iPhones, right? <laughs> I'm not sure it's the technology that makes us antisocial. But more than that, let's talk about being social. And let's talk about what the technology is making us do. So again, go to my kids. These are my two boys. And this was our cat Ripley, who was we're guessing by best estimates 23 years old and we lost Ripley a couple weeks ago and my boys had a rough time with it as we all do and I as a parent thanks Oliver and I as a parent had to go through this with my boys and we all we most of us have been through this before and it's very difficult whenever we have loss as a human it's hard and so the boys said they wanted to do something to commemorate Ripley. And could they build something for her, a memorial? And I said, absolutely, you bet we can. What do we have in mind? And they said, we want to do it in Minecraft. And I realized even more than I had the power of Minecraft. Now, first off, I want you to recognize how amazing this is. They made a memorial garden with plaques. This is in a city that we've created where they do all their building in Minecraft. So this is something they can visit anytime they want to. This is more a greater, grander place than they, with the skills of a seven and 10 year old, could have created in our world. They were able to do a memorial for her that fit in their mind with how they wanted to memorialize her. And I think it speaks highly of my children that they, when they wanted to do a memorial, went to the space where they felt most comfortable building and could do it at the level they wanted to. So my husband thought this was interesting too, and he put a comment up on Reddit saying this is, is what we did. And he got all these comments, like 80 comments on Reddit, things like this. When my bird passed away, I made a memorial for him on the server I played. It really helped me to make it. My eight-year-old daughter did the same thing when her dog died. It helped her get through it. So sorry for your loss. When I was going through a horrible bout of suicide, suicidal ideation, clinical depression, Minecraft was the only thing I could stand to do to occupy my mind for a long time. Sorry for your loss. Also, your kids are great builders. That's a beautiful memorial. So two incredible things are my takeaways. One, this is not unique to my kids. We are living in a society of people for whom the virtual world and the real world intermingle. And I'm not talking about that in a way of escapism or people who don't know the difference. People very well know the difference when they're in the real world versus the virtual world. But the virtual world is just an extension of that. And you take your emotions and your need and your grief with you, whether you're in the real or what people call the virtual world. But the other thing that I think was interesting is this process of putting it on Reddit became a healing of grief for my husband as well. Because look at these people who reached out to him to say, I'm sorry for your loss. Look at what your kids could do. I'm with you, man. I hear that. So you can't tell me that the virtual world is any less real or meaningful or influential than the world where we live. Now, of course, we look at technology and those of us over a certain age, have adopted the technology and we don't always know the best way to use it. So we default to the methods we use and in some cases fear the technology we're not used to because it can be so much work to keep up to it. And I understand that those at a certain age bring this bias with them. But what about this kid who lives in the digital world? And the students who are freshmen and even older than that, many of those who are up into their upper 20s now have grown up where social media has always been part of their youth and their teenage life. And this kid lives in the digital world. He is fully immersed in it. And as much as possible, it behooves us to join him in that world to facilitate teaching the way that he lives. Because he's going to use apps like this one we created, where he is looking at digital data to collect and make decisions that he needs to make, in this case, in animal production. 
or this is another app that we made when he is he's ready to do his financial payments where he's not only tracking and organizing his payments but he's making decisions about the ways in which he pays them to save money in how he approaches those debts but that child also is going to go into a career where his outreach or the way he spreads his information or the way he establishes himself as as a professional or the way he helps other people learn is digital. So he needs screen time. He needs the skills that we can teach in the digital world because this is the world he lives in. I'm tenured, I've gone through the process, which is lovely to be done. And I'll tell you, more people who find me as collaboration or as a game developer or as an article or as a journal reviewer, find me not through my published articles, but through my digital media through my YouTube videos, through my Twitter feed, <laughs> and I am fully now embracing this as a form of outreach, not just a form of promotion. Thanks, Oliver. So here's a good example of how games change things. This is a study um, that was, they reported on it in 2009. I need to look it up, I'm sure they've, they've updated it since then, but Gerard et al. took um, 80, 90 smokers who wanted to quit smoking, and put them into two groups. They put them all through a previously proven and successful smoking cessation program. And again, they all wanted to quit smoking. So they all went through this program as 12 weeks. And during four of those weeks, they sent participants in this into a lab where they would play a game for half an hour once a week. So the exposure to this game was two hours total. Over four weeks, they went for half an hour each. And they were put into two groups, the exact same game. It was a virtual reality game, so the users actually had the helmets on where they could see. And half the group played the game where they were running around this virtual world and they had to find cigarettes. And with their hands, they had to crush, just go shoop, with like a little Pac-Man motion with their fingers, crush the cigarette. And that was the game. The second group, who had exactly the same treatment, same program, went in half an hour a week or four weeks, exact same game, only they found little green rubber balls. And when they found the little green rubber balls, they would smash them with their hands. And amazingly, there was a significant difference between the two groups. And the group that had to smash the cigarettes had a higher success rate. They had a higher retention rate in the program. They stayed with it longer. And they had higher self-efficacy at the end of it that they believed they would be successful in smoking and would have less of a desire to start again. And that difference was made purely by smushing a virtual cigarette in a virtual helmet. Zanzi, very exciting, particularly in today's discussion of wearables and things like the Fitbit. So Zanzi is a pedometer for kids, an amazing pedometer, very heavily research influenced and research based. And this, when we talk about gamification, which is really just adding score and other game mechanics to behavior change, Zanzi is a great example of when gamification works. So the kids get Zanzi, they go online, they register, and they're given incentives at different points for increasing their steps. So, of course, they're doing research as to what incentives make a difference. Turns out a $5 Target gift card or a $25 gift card, same effect on the kids, same effect. But the biggest influence is when kids could do a charitable donation. So if you could increase your steps three days and meet your goal, a friend could have a pedometer or we'll make a donation to the World Wildlife Federation. So they're learning a lot about the entire types of incentives that can change behavior, in this case, for physical activity. And of course, the best examples of incentivized learning and behavior change are those that can incentivize you to change your behavior until those actions are so ingrained and part of your routine, you no longer need the incentives to do them. So, JC, you wondered about screen time. The reason I hate the term screen time and the fear is it makes people fear the pixel. The idea that this light coming behind a screen and the use of a battery is somehow damaging to kids. And my message is it's not about the pixel because you can have literature and reading and exposure to content from technology or to art or to increase communication with families when one of them is traveling or across generations or physical activity to encourage that kind of work or even social integration. This is a this last photo is one I took from a workshop I teach on a manners to uh, high school aged kids in 4-H and instead of teaching them 
manners, I put them in situations as part of a game where they have 15 minutes to research and I give them access to books and iPads and I tell them the situation their team's going to go into, such as a formal reception with the university president or a sit down dinner at a restaurant and they as a team get a research and then they send their uh, their team member into that environment and advise them on what to do. It's an incredibly social technology based research activity. Hey Dave, good to hear from you. So screen time, if you can help me spread the word man, it's not about the technology, it's about the activity that the technology enables. So gameplay changes things, it certainly facilitates teaching. This is not my video clip, um, this is from a group called Board Shorts. They take and record kids who are playing, and then they have the parents act out what the kids said. So let me share this one with you. Of course, I do math games as well, so I really enjoy this one. I said Board Shorts. It's kids snippets of this group. Have any of y'all seen this one already? Okay, here's your homework. Um, first let me tell you the directions, um, what form, take away five. One, two, three, four, five, six. What's take away. What's six, take away one? One. No, you take away, so you take away one out of six, how much does it equal? What's five, 10 minus one? I don't know. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. ten. Nope. Take away one. Which is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nope. One, two, three, four, five, six, six seven, eight. Is it painful? Eight and one more. <laughs> oh, it's so painful. And one more. How many is equal? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One. It equals, it makes nine. See how you take away? You take away one, and it equals one. Mm -hmm. Do you get it now? Yes. So I love that clip for a number of reasons, not the least of which is those kids who are playing at least one type Three. in, and those are the girls that they recorded right there. Shows you how old they are. At least one of them have been in a formal learning environment. And when they teach, they default to what we all default sometimes, which is, I can just tell you what I know, and that's enough for you. And as learners, it's like at some point he was like, if I just tell you I understand it, will you please stop teaching me? I don't want to learn anymore. So Dave, you asked about the, the potential for learning games for millennials. Um, and so I would say that we offer two things about that. Um, our millennials are certainly becoming our adult target audience, but when I was talking about Angry Birds earlier, what I love about that is we all do better with interactive learning. Now millennials might come to expect it more, and adults might say, when I ask, do you want to learn through games, they might say no, because that's not their mindset to where they have learned previously. But the things that make a game interactive, engaging, help you see your progress, help you um, develop your skill at your own pace, let you practice on your own in a safe environment, all of those are skills that are independent of age or the technology predilection of our learners. But your question is, does that change our instructional design? I would say yes, not so much because millennials demand it, but because the technology can really now adequately reflect and support the way learning could be for everybody. So gameplay facilitates teaching in one way because it can enable that exploration where learners can explore on their own. So I'm a constructivist, obviously, if you know anything about me and how I think people learn. I think people learn best when they're given a chance to construct their own knowledge based on their experiences. And Jean Piaget, who is, who is one of the, the thought leaders, 
thinkers and constructivists, and in this strand of learning theory, says, are we forming children who are only capable of learning what is already known? And of course, our college model is largely about that. The researcher goes and conducts research, and then she is able to share what she learns with her students. But of course, what we know is that we are training students for jobs that don't exist. The job I have didn't exist when I was in high school. I don't know that how they would have prepared me for it. But what we need to prepare them for is to think not about our content, but how to explore it and make sense of it on their own. So one of my examples is Starwalk, which is a fabulous app. You've probably seen it or something like it. It's a star map, so you can take it out in the world and um, look, hold up, look up at the night sky and be like, that's a bright light. Is that a star or a planet? And then you just hold your device between you and that planet and because your device knows where on the earth you are and what time it is and the date, it can tell you exactly what those stars are. So it's just in time, just in place learning. And I would show people Star Walk, and there was this dotted line across there. You can see that dotted line across the diagonal. People would say, what's the dotted line? And I said, I don't know, but I noticed all the planets were on a dotted line. And I thought, are we in some strange phase where dotted line, like where planets are all in alignment? What? Why is that? And if I were in a class learning about different things, and instead of being told the answer, someone said, go find out what that dotted line means. I might have had some of the same experiences. Where then I went to an app called Solar System, which is a fabulous, I call it a, an encyclopedia, a tabletop, uh, encyclopedia, uh, tabletop app. As you know, those encyclopedia books, which are like tabletop apps, books, which are really, you should just turn the pages. That's what Solar System is. So you can click onto these apps, you can learn about it, you can spin the app around, but you can go to the orrery, and the orrery shows the sun in the middle and the planets around, and you realize that there are planets around the sun in like a dinner plate right? They don't just orbit all at different angles. The sun's in the middle and the planets all go around on a plane around it. And that's the dotted line. And though I might have learned that at some point in my 21 years of being in a classroom, because I was first given the question, it had so much more meaning to it when I was given the opportunity to learn my own answer. So JC says, I learned about world history and diplomacy from civilization, an excellent example. Simulations like uh, civilization, a roller coaster tycoon, or, or zoo tycoon, a sim city, give you the ability to explore, look at, and understand in ways that are more contextually relevant. In the same way, I can learn about history by reading a historical novel. The historical novel might be a fictionalized version, but it helps me put all of that into context. Gameplay certainly facilitates exploration, but it also gives learners a more capable other. With our Mass Next games, we have, oh, Oliver, I haven't played SimCity on my cell phone. I should do that. That would be awesome. Um, so our Mass Next games, we have a series of games that can be played for math that's sixth graders, the content. Actually, it's about the concepts that kids struggle with. And we came up we had kind of this epiphany moment in development. We knew we'd have materials that would support the teachers, but we realized how many materials we needed to support teachers because teachers have really real questions like what do I do when the kids are playing? How do I have discussion? How can I take this conceptual understanding kids get through playing the games and apply it? And those are the issues that I think we and other teaching faculty can think about is not whether or not games are in the classroom, but how can I facilitate that in a kind of learning that's different from what I do. And all of those materials are online for Mass Next. I would encourage you, even though this is for a child audience, a young, much younger audience, go look at one of the games on massnext.org and watch just one, take your pick, of the teaching with videos. They're all shorter than 10 minutes that teach the teacher ways to use that game in the classroom. JC, isn't that amazing? You say that you, you've thought about buildings need electricity and water without that game. Well, why would we think about those things? It's all about putting us in an environment where we need to ask the right questions. And of course, gameplay also provides differentiation. Each learner can get something different out of it. A friend of mine who is at PBS Mobile, she now, she just moved to Denmark to work for Lego Mobile. Um, she says the best technology engages the user in something he doesn't normally have access to. And I think what's important about that is Every learner has access to different types of tools. Um, the power of the iPad is not that I can read a book on it. 
The power of the iPad is that I can have access in my fingertip to thousands of books or that I can read a book that's perfect for me and my husband can read a book on the same device that's ideal for him. Games can provide that differentiation. It's frog dissection, this is a pretty good little app. My son, the same one who drew the interface, before he could read, kept playing with this app. And it's just a page turn. You can just go through and dissect a frog. And I kept saying, honey, you don't, this isn't, no, pick a better app. You know, you need to be able to read. Pick another app. Pick another app. And he kept playing with it. And he kept playing with it. And when we went to Graham's and Granddad's house, he asked if he could borrow the iPad because he wanted to show Graham's what the inside of a frog looked like. Which, you know, there's worse ways for a six-year-old to show someone what the inside of a frog looks like. But my point is, I not only didn't give him access to this, I kind of tried to deny him access to it by saying it wasn't appropriate for him. And what I realized was he discovered that we have a scientific process for these things, that there is a reason we go through. He started making connections between what lungs in a frog do and what lungs in a human do. But more importantly, he enjoyed learning about that process and exploring something so very different right, to him. There's power in that. I want to close with just another thing to kind of get us thinking. And this is back to that, what world do we live in? And how do we put people into that world? So this is Glee. It's a karaoke app um, based on the TV show that just ended. Um, you know, you have a show that's all about kids singing songs. It makes sense that you create an app that allows people to sing the songs from the show, and that's what Glee is. Um, have any of y'all seen this app? Hope or JC or Oliver or Dave? Um, so it's like karaoke apps, you know, you can sing, and those bars at the bottom, they'll show you if you're on pitch or not. You can sing into the mic, twink, twinkle, twink, twink, twinkle, twinkle, little, little star. And it'll show you if, yeah, I know my singing's fantastic there, but. <laughs> so you can go in and sing. But here's what's amazing about it. You can go in if you register, and you can go to a world map and it will show you all of the people who are currently using the app. Now this of course is more powerful when the show was on, but each of those little pulsing lights when I did, took the screenshot were people who at that time were singing a song with the app. And more amazingly, I could click on any of them and sing a duet with them real time anywhere in the world. We could sing real time with each other. Amazing. So, in this world, you can then make friends, you can talk to people, you can hear each other's recordings, you can talk to each other about them, you can give Gleek points, and give people who are really good. So it kind of becomes this online community of people who share this really powerful, similar interest, who are engaged with each other about this activity. And this is, this is just a karaoke app, right? So, when the tsunami hit, which was two years ago, a little over two years ago. And that was a pretty powerful time. And we, as I talked about with my cat, um, you know, when something happens and grief hits, we as humans um, seek other people who have shared the same experience. That's why we have wakes, that's why we have funerals, that's why we sought out other people when 9-11 happened. And so this age group, which tends to be in the, the teen and the lower 20s age group, did what other people do when they experienced loss and they went to their community for support. <laughs> I just read your clothes, Dave. So they said, hey, let's all get together at this time and let's sing a song in support of the victims of the tsunami. So, if I might mention a few things. Remember when I showed you the picture of the globe that each pulsing light was someone who was singing? Well, you look at the bottom right of this, there were over 2,000 people singing. And the server couldn't even get everybody. But notice how worldwide this was. Every continent had someone singing on it. And in this case, those bars of light literally represented 
two people making a connection around the world, 2,000 people around the world. You can see the quotes, what people were saying while this was happening. Every time I hear this, it makes me cry. God bless Japan. This is amazing and really touching. And you can go on and find the video. At one point I saw there were 7,000 people who could log in and add their voice to the chorus. And Oliver, you're right. This is a global community. Because I will tell you, this says, I hope the people of Japan are listening. And I doubt the people of Japan were listening. Because I can be cynical, and I can tell you that I don't think this did much for the victims of the tsunami. But of course, it wasn't designed to. It was designed to do something for the people who were doing the singing. And we talk about thinking globally, acting locally. This is the world we are in. Our community, our people defined by things more than just our proximity to each other. And the activities in which we engage are as much about the content we're exposed to as the way in which we engage in that learning. And, and JC, making people feel like they belong, community, that's exactly what we are trying to foster in our learners. Not just content and not just learning the way it's been done before, but engaging in a process to learn on their own and solve those problems. So we go back to that question, can gameplay help people learn? Absolutely, it can, it does, and it will because we are getting better at helping people learn through it. And as much as gameplay changes things, it's not the gameplay, it's the education that changes things, it's our teaching that changes things, we change things. And this talk is not really a specific how to go play this game now. This talk is meant for the innovators for the thought changers, the people who say, how can I make this happen? And I'm hoping that that, that I know, and because I know Dave and Oliver already, I know that's true with two of you, and JC and Hope from your comments, I think it is too. And if this interests you, may I please encourage you to read Greg Topo's new book, It Gestures or Least, The Game Believes in You. Greg is uh, a writer for USA Today, he was the education writer, and as such, he went around traveling and kept seeing games do education. So this is an incredibly well-researched book where he shows specific examples of how games are transforming learning. It's a great read. He's a very good writer. And look, five customer reviews, five stars. It's, it's really getting some great press because it's so well done. So my question is, it's okay to play, will we change things? So with that, let's take a few minutes, pop up this chat window and um, talk a little bit. Or I guess we can enable our mics as well, Oliver, I'll let you decide on that. Yeah, we can certainly enable mics. Uh, that's not a problem. Uh, that might m m might uh, make things a little bit easier. Uh, thank you so much, Barbara. And I'm sure there are some questions uh, from others as well. But let me start off with uh, something that I just read today in the New York Times, and that is the changing role of the professor as not so much um, uh, being really a, a, a guide for students, but more like uh, just being basically a uh, an assignment provider and a grader uh, instead of a guide. Um, where do you think games can come into play in that? Because what, what I see in online education is that I want to supplement what I'm doing with as many hands-on activities as I can do. And in the online educational field, obviously, uh, games are or simulations for that matter as well, are an excellent way to do that, to get student engaged. So how can I, how do you think our our role as educators will change in that regard moving forward? Well, of course, and so I'm teaching class this fall, I've taught it before, but game-based learning. So, you know, there's going to be incredible irony and it's going to happen when I give a lecture on game-based learning because <laughs> everything I need to teach, I cannot turn into a game. I just don't have that type, that time. 
And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for us. Is I think there's a lot of faculty who are like, absolutely, give me the game I need, I'll play it in my classroom now. But the problem, it used to be the problem is people didn't even want to do that. Now that they want to, I don't know that we have the games ready for them. We are starting to see them. And so I think it's up to us now to try to start facilitating that and realize we cannot make we can't just use the games, we're going to have to make them. Now, having said that, there's places that say, sure, you can implement a game in your classroom today. Here's a PowerPoint template that's actually a game of Jeopardy. Just put your content in and boom, you can have a game in your classroom today, which is certainly possible. And JC, your timing is perfect. How do you match learning objectives? to games. If your learning objective is for your students to be able to answer questions about the content you give them, then Jeopardy is absolutely the right game for you to give them. And I can't be too cynical, you know, much of our K-12 education right now is focused on kids, developing kids' ability to answer questions. And um, if that's really what we want them to learn, there are some games you can very easily implement right now. For us, and gosh, that's a whole other talk for us I think the most important thing is what is the learning objectives to the game if your learning objective is to change behavior we're working on now on an interactive we're doing on a, for nutrition uh, to help understand tube feeding this is for uh, bachelor's and master's level students to understand the complexity of a tube feeding system for students in, in hospitals and to realize that you might be able to say sure I can set up a tube feeding system you got this, you've got your rate, you've got your flow, you've got what kind of bag it is, but not understanding how any one of those things impacts other parts of the system. So we are, we start with our learning objectives, which in this case is first to recognize the complexity of the system and that any one part can change any other part of it. The second objective is to be able to design, given certain parameters, the ideal bag feeding system for a patient. And then thirdly, to be able to predict how any one of those changes would change the others. So we are working now in creating an interactive that engages the learner in those kinds of activities so that they have a chance not to practice and not to answer questions back, but to interact with it and see that you have this kind of bag, this is what could happen. You have this kind of, of, uh, of um, formula that you're using, this is how your flow rate changes, so that through that interactivity they can start making the predictions and how they answer that. Uh, another game we're working on is credit score for high school kids. So our learning objectives for that, we start with our objectives and then we turn that into, which is the change we want to happen in the learner, that we turn that into what kinds of activities, and I call them transformational activities, what kind of activities must the learner engage in to make that kind of change and it's usually not answering questions it's usually about experimenting or exposure or predicting those kinds of things and then how do you build a game around that barb this is dave can you hear me you bet hey dave so uh, you know this is fascinating a really great job today i appreciate uh, you taking the time and and, uh, and laying this out for us uh, one of the one of the reasons I pose the question about uh, millennials is uh, is not in, in, you know and the instructional design is uh, it, it's a little more subtle than you know basically incorporating interactive capability into the into the development that we do. Um, I'm wondering whether or not millennials, <clears throat> even perhaps uh, some of them a little older. Than millennials, but especially millennials on down, have a slightly to, or maybe greatly different method of learning, uh, at, at a fundamental uh, method of learning because of their experience in gaming, and because of that, rather, I mean, you know, so obviously creating gaming type things, simulations, uh, um, etc., interactive capability in, but should we should is there, is there an understanding about how they learn any differently than others that would have an impact on almost all that we bring to it, whether it is based in simulations or, or anything uh, that is kind of overtly game-like? Does that make any sense? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm interested in seeing what you all think. So if I understand correctly, you're saying, you know, is there something about how, how the learner is raised that changes inherently how they learn? 
my initial reaction to that is, well, of course, we don't know for sure how people learn. You know, we, we have lots of theories ourselves. I mean, my gosh, just Google, you know, go to Wikipedia and look up learning theories. Do people learn behaviorally? Do they learn by constructivism? Do they learn by constructing environment? You know, there's all sorts of different ways. And kind of the latest on that is, you know, the belief is that people not only learn differently based on who they are, when you look at like, um, oh, uh, uh, the, oh, what is it, this gardeners with the different types of learners, socio-emotional, kinetic, you know, that people learn different ways. Or is it specific to the content? There's some of that thought, like anything that has automaticity to it, like typing or vocabulary is best if it's tied to some kind of physiological or physical action. So we don't really know how people learn. I would be skeptical that, um, I, would be, I would be hesitant to say that people learn differently as a result of their experiences. But I think it's fair to say that their strategies for what works for them are shaped by exposure to different things and their expectations for what learning should be are shaped. So again, go back to my son who's ADHD, you know, there's a lot of things in learning environments that just don't work for him. And his struggle is to come up with strategies that work. And I'll tell you, one of the strategies he's developed is he's really good at memorizing really good at memorizing because that's how you can fake paying attention to things. <laughs> Someone asks you something. Memorizing is easy because he doesn't have long-term attention to stick to something. So he's learned he has to memorize it immediately. So my suspicion is people's comfort level is higher with exploration and slow learning and not knowing the answer to something when they've come from games because they're confident in their ability to explore and find it. It. Whereas people who have spent their life developing learning strategies of tell me what you need me to know and I will tell you back what that is, the idea of, well, I don't know what you need to learn, go and figure that out for yourself is extremely stressful to them. That's, that's my initial take on it. Um, and forgive me, I know I've been calling you JC, I'm, I know I'm pr going to pronounce this right. Is it Jiaqian? JC, forgive me if I'm butchering your name. And um, <laughs> you're very kind. I, I hate not doing someone's name correctly because that's such a personal, important thing. Um, so I hope. Uh, so uh, I think we had to have more training and learning to read. Games provide immediate feedback, which is more intuitive. I think that's true. You know, I hear that thing about millennials having a shorter attention span. I hear that all the time, and I I would love to see a physiological study on that. You know, in the same way that they were able to do a physiological study on attention, on a multitasking, and that actually people don't multitask. They develop strategies to divert attention quickly from one thing to another and back again, but they actually cannot multitask. And so in the same way, I think millennials might not have a shorter attention span. They might have a shorter tolerance. You know, I think back in the day, I remember sitting in a lecture and I got really good at making it look like I was engaged in you and my brain was anywhere but that. So I think the ways we have measured attention span might be different. I think people have always had better attention spans when they were engaged in trying to figure things out than when they were simply listening. But again, this is anecdotal and theoretical on my part. Yeah, but it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and those are coping mechanisms I think we all learn exactly. over time. Right. And that's why I say I'm not sure technology creates new learning. I think it just finally has caught up with the ways that we know facilitated learning. I mean, look at 4-H. 4-H is about hands-on learning. I mean, learning by doing is the motto. Because, and the, the whole um, tell me and I will forget, what's the phrase, tell me and I'll learn, to, tell me I'll forget, but in, involve me and I'll remember, something like that. We have always known that people do better when they have a project that they have to learn on. You know, it's just project-based learning. Technology and games have just given us a way to facilitate that digitally because it's not always realistic to engage firefighters in saving a human life with a human life at risk. You know, it's kind of hard to give them hands-on learning because you're only going to have access to so many people having heart attacks every year. And it would be nice to let them practice on someone that isn't actually dying at the time. And so technology is just really giving us a way to catch up with the ways that's helped everybody learn. Same applies to frogs. What's that? Same applies to frogs. Absolutely. We I read a, a grant proposal. I was on a review committee, and they were proposing um, a whole range of um, dissection 
apps and software, which was, was great. And unfortunately, they were unable to articulate why that was valuable. And they kept saying, well, we could save money on lab supplies. And that's, that's true. But what's really remarkable about dissecting in the real world isn't just that you're saving these animals from being killed. That's fine. It's that you can back up, you can rewind, you can do it again. You can, you know, there's so many things you can do in a virtual world. And so I don't think it's a matter of can virtual dissection replace real dissection. I think it's a matter of when would you use each. Because when you do virtual dissection, it's a great way to practice and get all those things down so that then when you have a real animal and the stomach looks really different, then you can start having the real discussions about why this stomach was distended. We're doing that now with an interactive we're doing for a soil absorption study, which you may know, I didn't, but soil absorption is a very one of the most basic lab studies that you do in soil and water sciences, which is really to figure out how much of an agent, a chemical, a fertilizer, whatever, can soil absorb, absorb out of the water. It doesn't absorb like a sponge, but it collects whatever that chemical is on the outside of the particle of soil. And so everyone does soil absorption studies, and they're, they're time consuming, and they can take, you have to set something in the centrifuge, and you come back in two days, and you have to put on the shaker tail, and you have to come back in two weeks. And so what we wanted them to learn was not just how to do a soil absorption study, we wanted to give them exposure to a best case situation, see what it looks like, so that then when they get into the lab, they can spend their time learning the really important stuff, which is things like, um, how do I know if an error is critical? If I drop this, do I have to start the study exactly from the beginning again? I'm going to pick it up from here. How do I know when the studies are different or weird or I need to have attention to it? The, the, just the learning how to do it in a perfect way. We can do that virtually online. You can practice and practice it so that then your lab time is spent on the really important stuff. You know, we have a series of uh, chemistry labs online. Uh -huh. And uh, we have done some analysis uh, after graduation of students who went through the full online chemistry package and then got jobs in the chemical industry and those who took the chemistry labs face to face yeah and found that the employers actually prefer uh, some of our students that learn the chemistry labs online because they know why they're doing what they're doing and are not so nervous about the manual dexterity it takes to titrate or whatever Right. Uh, and that's, you know, it gets back to, uh, you know, what's the purpose of the learning here? In many cases, you know, a lab tech needs to know how to, you know, physically know how to do things. But most of our, the po folks we interviewed said, we can teach them to do that. What we need is have to them understand why they're doing it. Right. Right. And that's and especially some critically extent, important. When you have a really fabulous faculty member, what do I want him or her to spend their time doing? Is it teaching the rote stuff that's the same every single time? No, let a computer do that. Let's save the faculty member for teaching things like, now, why would this occur the way it does? How would it, you know, let's save that faculty member for doing the stuff that they are uniquely able to do. Um, we're starting a new project on chemistry for soil and environmental sciences, doing more labs. Um, so. Um, Dave, perhaps we can talk over email. I'd love to talk to whoever was working on that with y'all and see how we could build on some of your stuff so we don't replicate. Sure, we can put you in contact with them. Nice. All right. Okay. So, Oliver, I, I know I got a little wordy and, and talkative, but I'm looking at the clock and I don't want to take us beyond your allocated time either. Okay, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's fine. Are there any other questions? Uh, Hope, JC, Dave? Thank you very much. Yeah, hey, thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, that was a, a, a great uh, talk and certainly uh, things that I think we all can take to heart as, uh, as the next years and, and many changes come and games become more available for us in the setting. Um, and on all levels of education, I think it's important to realize their value. Um, uh, so uh, the next... Um, ADEC webinar will take place on June 17th. That's also Wednesday, and it will actually be a um, review of the ADEC Symposium. So uh, for those of you who cannot attend next week's ADEC Symposium at the Oregon State University, uh, we will provide a little bit of a review. We have some uh, very uh, good presenters um, at uh, uh, the ADEC Symposium, and uh, uh, I think it's worth uh, to review uh, what we will be hearing about. 
Um, so that will be uh, the next webinar. Um, Barbara, thanks again for taking the time today. Uh, thanks everybody for attending and have a good rest of your day and a good evening coming up. Thanks so much for making this happen, Oliver and Dave. And Hope and JC, thanks for putting time into this today. Okay, thank you everybody, take care.